Welcome to Profit Boss Radio. I'm your host, Hillary Hendershot, certified financial planner and owner of every money mistake you can imagine. I now run a successful financial planning and wealth coaching firm. I'm here to share with you what I learned turning failure into financial freedom. Profit Boss Radio is all about how women like us are authoring our own lives, rewriting the rule book of money and running incredible businesses. If you like this show, hit subscribe, share it with a friend and leave us that five-star review. Are you ready, Profit Boss? Let's do this. Did you know that almost 40% of business owners in this country consider themselves to be financially illiterate? Maybe this is you. It's not that you don't know how to grow a business. It's just that you're so in the weeds with the daily rigor of running that business that you're not really clear how much is coming in. And you're definitely not sure why there's so little left at the end of the day. You got into business for the freedom entrepreneurship can offer, but now you just feel like a hamster on a wheel working 24 seven with not much to show for it. If you're totally overwhelmed by your business numbers, I can help. I've worked with hundreds of business owners just like you. I can show you the numbers to take control of your business's profitability, pay yourself more, and heal your relationship with money. But we have to get face-to-face. See, I want to show you how to become a profit boss. That's the name of this podcast, and I'm going to share my step-by-step approach with you. It's all part of my new live training called How to Own Your Business Numbers and Increase Your Profitability Without Sacrificing Your Purpose, Joy, or Integrity. Sounds great, right? I'm going to share the best of what I've learned working with business owners for two decades now. I'm not only going to show you how to identify the leaky faucets in your profit funnel, I'm also going to give you the wrench to fix them. And this is no canned pre-recorded event. I'm going to be 100% live with you, and it's available only for an exclusive period of time. This live training takes place on September 8th at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. That's this September 8th at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. This training can really unlock that next level of success for you. And the best part, besides the fact that we'll be live together, is it's totally free. To register, just go to hillaryhendershot.com forward slash more profit. That's hillaryhendershot.com forward slash more profit. Grab your seat today, and I can't wait to show you how to become a profit boss. See you in the training. Well, hello, Profit Boss. Welcome to this very special interview with founder and CEO of Startup Parent, Sarah Kathleen Peck. She actually happens to be a good friend of mine. We met in a mom's group that has been extremely resourceful and helpful for me. So just a great place to meet women who are up to amazing things. Sarah is a little bit different from our our normal guests, our ordinary guests, but I'll, I'll let that story tell itself. Sarah is the host of the Startup Parent Podcast, and I'll have her tell us about that. It's an award-winning podcast featuring women in entrepreneurship, business, and parenting, and she writes about work, culture, and parenting. Her work has been featured in Forbes, Inc., Fast Company, The New York Times, Harvard Business Review, and more, so a very well-pedigreed woman. Uh, She's also, I just learned this this morning from reading her bio, a 20-time NC2A All-American swimmer, successfully swam the escape from Alcatraz nine separate times, once doing the swim, totally naked. (laughs) So nudity, this might be the first word, the first time naked has been said on my podcast. It's very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that feels like the theme of the interview too, right? I feel like I'm going <laughs> to... Talking about money can make you feel naked. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, So let's start. Just tell people what about what they should know about startup parent. How can they know what that is? Oh, it's so fun. I work with women entrepreneurs and people who are adjacent to entrepreneurship. So a lot of times you're 15 years into a career and you think you might want to start something or you've had an idea for a while. So business leaders, people in um, long-term career tracks, people thinking of starting something on the side, and then people who are raising venture capital. I work with those women, those women and parents, and we've done 200 interviews so far of the podcast. Wow. Amazing. And you're, and you're a fantastic writer as well. 
So when we were talking about money a few weeks ago, you said something that I think, and they say, start with the big idea. So the big idea of this conversation is you don't have to make a ton of money to live the life that you want. And you can't see her, but she's doing jazz hands. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I think it's really true. I think I, I think something that's really important to me about money is that money is a tool. Yeah. And if you don't get clear on what it is that you want and what makes it, what it is that makes you happy, money is pretty worthless because you can have a ton of money and you can be very unhappy. And so the most important thing for me is figuring out what you want and then matching the money situation to being able to get what you want. And a lot of people actually don't want what they think they want, right? It's like, actually, the thing that I want is time with my kids and I want to be able to take hikes and and I want to send my kid to a nice daycare. So, okay, exactly how much money do I need for that? That's my goal. It's not to become a multimillionaire being incredibly unhappy in a job that I hate where I never get to see my family. Well, one thing I've learned about, I have had the occasion to interact with some uh, extraordinarily wealthy people. And the thing I found most sad about that is that all those people are currently engaged in, let me not say all, many of those people are currently engaged in how to live beyond death, right? So they're worried about their own mortality. And I just find that to be so sad that they're not fulfilled as human beings in this life right now. And then the second thing I'll say is I often say when I speak publicly, I often say, you know, really this talk is about money, but I have to be honest, I don't actually care about your money. I care about you. And it, we're not talking about, you know, you're stranded on the side of the freeway and you can't afford a ride to get to a safe place. Like money solves that problem. But beyond that, this is about you having a fulfilled, happy, satisfied life. And I think a lot of people are addicted to more, more, more. So I think your narrative and your lived truth about that is really, really interesting. And I think it can bring a lot of peace to people. So talk to me about how you think about, well, let's just start from the beginning. Kind of tell us the, tell us the, the money story you want to tell us. You know, it's so interesting. And I was, I was so like kind of piqued by getting to be on the show because I don't, I wouldn't say I've quote unquote made it, but then it depends what lens you you look through because I have, I've done what I wanted to do. And I started my own company. I have a family, like I get to spend time doing what I want and with the people I love. But I have gone through a number of journeys and experiments to get here. When I was a young kid, we there's four of us growing up, four kids growing up, and we were pretty scrupulous. My parents are pretty, you know, conservative in terms of like, we didn't get to do lots of big things, but they did help us save financially. And I went to college, I went to graduate school, I took on obscene amounts of debt in graduate school, because it was the thing to do, right? You go to graduate school, you get a degree, of course, it's going to cost $100,000. Right. And it's like this foregone conclusion that that means success after that. It, after that just comes career success, right? Then you just get career success. I would like to, to lay that to rest because I took, uh, I had $20,000 in student loan debt from undergrad. And then I had $80,000 from graduate school. So I had about $100,000 in debt. I got an Ivy League education. And my first job out of graduate school in 2008 in the middle of the recession paid me $46,000. And it wasn't until after I got into that job and I looked at my rent and my student loan payments and my take home pay on my pay stub. And I said, How how does this work? Like, I don't understand why didn't anyone tell me? And I have a responsibility to have done that before, but I really blindly trusted people. I blindly trusted that going to graduate school was a great idea and that it would all work out. And it, it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, I did my MBA really to cure my own self-confidence problems. And um, there were a number of people in my program who I think were very unhappy in, you know, it's in Silicon Valley. So a, a lot of engineers who wanted to get into management, wanted more autonomy, wanted more decision-making power. And I don't think the MBA translated to that for them at all. I, I'm not sure that it contributed to my professional success, except I met my husband there. So it's like the most expensive dating service ever. <laughs> <laughs> 
I did not meet my husband. In <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, um, that's really fascinating. That leads into the, my 20s, which was, uh, I was 25 when I graduated from graduate school, I think 24 or 25. Um, so it's pretty young because I went to college a little bit on the young side. And I had massive amounts of debt, a job that didn't pay enough. And I scrambled a bit, right? I took buses, I worked side jobs, I worked on the weekend. And I put together a pretty comprehensive plan. And then once I figured out my budget, I decided to start saving 10% of my salary at that point. And then every time I got a bonus, I saved a little bit more. So if I got a bonus, I would bump it up to 12% or I bump it up to 14%. And I read a bunch of books, you know, The Millionaire Next Door, Ramit Sethi's book, a couple of other ones. I think I listened a lot to, oh, who's that famous podcast guy? The most famous, your money? No, Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey. Yeah, thank you. I listened to him and I was like, okay, I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to save. And I had a bit of savings from college because my parents helped me, which we can get into. But um, I, I had this big audacious goal of saving a hundred thousand dollars by the time I turned 30 and saving a million dollars by the time I turned 40. And I looked at the numbers and I was like, well, how on earth am I going to get there? And remember I was negative 100 in the hole. Like I was, I was really working out of a hole. And I remember the day I called my dad when I was 28 and I was like, dad, dad, I'm worth nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I got the zero. <laughs> I was like, I finally have zero dollars. I don't like, I still technically, I still owed some money, but I had savings at the same amount. So like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dot com, right? I remember my like, zero day too, girl. I remember my zero day. <laughs> <There's> nothing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what? Okay. So, uh, did you get to a hundred thousand dollars by 30? You know, I did. I did. And I am surprised by it because it's not like my income radically increased. I negotiated. I, you know, I got 10% increases, but that's not a lot. I got, you know, sometimes I got 15% increases and I started some side projects. One of my first side hustles paid me about $30,000 on the side. It did not pay me. It, it revenue was 30 K on the side, right? I had to pay taxes, had to, but I had some pocket change. And it was really through saving about 16% of what I made, even at that low salary uh, year over year. And then when I got a bonus, I would put some of it into my savings. And then sometimes I would put the whole chunk into my savings and paying down my student loan debt pretty aggressively. So I put it on a 10 year plan and then putting, if I had a little bit of extra cash, putting a little bit towards the student loans and then Six years later, I had saved, I, I hit, I have the screenshots. I still have the screenshots of my mint. I sent it to my dad. I was like, dad, I'm worth hundred K. Like I have hundred K. And he was like, that's really, actually really great. Like he was really proud Pretty of me. Remarkable. Well, and I, I actually think that's a, an, a nod toward the power of manifesting that sometimes almost always when it comes to manifesting something you don't currently have and don't know how to produce. And I don't know if you would use the word manifesting, but I'm a little bit woo about money and just you're a powerful woman. And so there's no reason, you know, given your consistent dedication, staying focused on the goal that you wouldn't be able to do that. Right. Like money shows up when you sort of command it to do so. And there's something about those side hustles and your willingness to save that money versus spend it that pays off. I love manifesting and I am, I'm a, like woo with a, like a large side of science. So I actually dug into the, the psychology and the science behind manifestation and like what's woo and what actually works. And so I've geeked out about this. I've written about it on my blog. I have a course about it called get what you want. And if you get really clear on what you want and you get really clear on why you want it and it's something that you actually want, then you will pursue it, right? That's that's something that will that you can take ownership over. In addition, there, there are things like psychological priming and it's the effect of if I tell you like, hey, Hillary, let's walk down the street and also the color red is awesome, you'll probably see things like red cars and stop signs and stoplights that are red. Yeah. Right? We can prime ourselves. So when we go through the effort of writing down a goal and priming ourselves, and then we use questions that aren't like, am I going to get this? Yes, no. If we use non-binary questions, but we instead ask like, how is this possible? All of a sudden you can start to be like, okay, my goal is here. I have to do this much each year. Compound interest and growth looks like this will happen. So how might I earn $5,000 more per year? 
Yes. And that's getting into a state of wonder as opposed to certainty that it can't happen. Yeah. Right. Because when you are in a, in a, in a state where you don't know how to get or produce a particular result, it's silly to stand in front of the mirror and say, I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich, because your brain is just going to go, mm, you're actually not. <laughs> right? Right, right. The cognitive dissonance is going to be strong with that. It's going to be right. like, but actually I have data that proves otherwise. But actually I'm worth zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm and, worth nothing. <laughs> and that's that. And I use that as a reframe, a suggested reframe for people all the time. It's like, instead of trying to convince yourself of something, you know, isn't true, just get into a state of wonder. How can I get there? How is this possible? How can I call this in? You know? Yes. So that's great. I love to hear your science about manifesting. And get super, super, super clear on what you want. Like, I think that most people are like, oh, I want to be a millionaire, but they, there's no like depth to it. Like, what's it for? What exactly will you do with that money? Where is it going to go? How much do you need each year? Like that specificity of knowing, yeah, I'm going to be a millionaire because I'm going to do X, Y, and Z with it. Like the house I want to buy is $600,000. The college education I want is this. I'm going to pursue my MBA, even though it's a, like a gobsmacking amount of money, right? When you get specific about it, it's easier to remember and believe in the goal. So, so it seems a little silly to ask, how do you really get clear what you want? But I think you you and I both agree that it's, it can be hard to get there. What, what did you, how did you, how did you accomplish that? How do you, how do you get clear on a goal? Yeah. How do you get clear on what you really want when I guess the messages from society can be so confusing and overwhelming? Yeah. So I worked with people through this in a couple of the questions. I use the five whys, which is not my invention. It's popular out there, but ask yourself why you want something five times. So really go deep. Like I want a fancy gym membership. Why? Because I want to look good. Why? You know, what, what, what will it feel like when I look good? Well, I want to, you know, be attractive to people. Why? Right. Because I'm, I'm lonely and I want to be in a partnership. Like I want to get to know people. Oh, why? Um, and you, you really dig down there and you're like, you know, because like, I'm not satisfied with my current life because I live alone. And you're like, oh, that's really interesting. Like maybe getting a gym membership is not the thing that you actually want, but you want to connect to more people. Right. But you have that specificity. It's, it requires bravery. Right. A lot of times the inner emotions, the inner psychology, there's fear, there's um, intimidation, there's insecurity, there's past trauma, little t trauma. Right. Like getting to know yourself is really hard. But when you do, it's so incredibly rewarding because you're like, oh, I'm lonely. And now I can ask myself, how can I be a little less lonely? Like, what can I do about it? And maybe the answer is money. And maybe the answer is like going and trying to do triathlons or joining a meetup group or like there's, there's different ways to solve the problem. So talk to me about, I talk a lot about the importance of your financial narratives and you, you already said you see money as a tool. So that's helpful. I think that's a good starting, starting place, but I think a really interesting place to look is uh, I've heard the term recently and I love it, your thought and emotional landscape, because it's important to have happiness and joy and pride and a sense of satisfaction about things. So tell me what you think and feel about money. Just give us a sense of your inner workings about money. I love that you see it as a tool. I also find like, I'm really satisfied. I think quiet confidence is part of it. I want to be alert, educated, and aware. Like I, I'm very annoyed when I don't understand how something works. And I feel really empowered when I get to go figure it out. So if there's something I don't understand, I might be frustrated for a while, but I really love, there's a quote attributed to Michelle Obama recently. And she, she was talking about the senators and like, was she intimidated being in Congress? And you know, what was it like to be there with all of these powerful men? I'm going to butcher the quote, but essentially it's, well, they're not that smart is her quote <laughs> where she's just like, I looked around and she's like, they're not that smart. And it's, it's more, it's not putting other people down. It's more like everybody here is figuring it out is the way that I interpret it. And I'm allowed to figure it out too, right? No one has the secrets to the universe. I can be like, how does that work? How do taxes work? Who do I need to know? Well, how much do I have to pay here? And so like when I didn't understand crypto, I'm like, well, what would I do to figure it out? You know, where can I read and what can I learn? And how do I get to have power and take power back of my own life so that when I'm 60, I'm not, you know, stuck. Or when I'm 80, I'm not wondering or wishing I had done something else. So... I guess, yeah, those are some of my kind of states of mind.
Yeah. Hillary here with a quick timeout to tell you how we can work together to improve and even make your financial life 100% organized and hassle-free. As a listener, you probably know my story. I made every money mistake in the book until I finally figured out the power of learning how to change my brain, including my beliefs about money. This allowed me to multiply my wealth to over eight figures. And since then, I've created a done-for-you comprehensive course to teach other business owners exactly how I did it. I've also been a wealth and financial financial advisor to women and couples for more than 20 years now. If you think we may be a great fit to work together, go to hillaryhendershot.com and just start a conversation. We provide fee only fiduciary advice to our clients, which means our clients never ever pay commissions. And we do only what's in your best interest, just like it's supposed to be for all financial advisors. If you want to see how my team and I measure up as financial advisors, check out our Yelp reviews at hillaryhendershot.com forward slash Yelp. All right, let's get back to the show. Okay. So let's talk about, you, you had kind of brought us up to approximately your age 30, but at that point you're still, I think you had a, a, you were a wage earner. So now you're fully entrepreneur. So tell us about the evolution from, and I don't know if you want to share your approximate age. How long has it been since you were 30? <laughs> <laughs> Seven and a half years. I'm, I'm almost 38. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm getting close to 40 and the, the roadmap here is it's really been bumpy because I would have thought that my twenties were my lowest earning phase, except I joined a startup and that is highly like, that's highly risky. And then I went off on my own. So my salary went back down because I was starting out on my own and then grew it up again. And then, uh, you know, have all these savings. I've grown my salary up again. Uh, I decided to have children that's not cheap. So I have two kiddos and between two kiddos and putting them to daycare in New York City, where it, wherever you are in the United States, the cost of daycare per child is about the cost of a one bedroom. So take your one bedroom times two in New York City, it's incredibly expensive. And so like everything I was saving went into childcare just so I could get to work again. And then I decided to start a company in while I had young children at home. And so that oh, first nonsensical. year <laughs> is so great. It was so great. That first year we made $30,000. It was, it was like kind of an accident into the company. I thought I was writing a book. I thought I was taking time off to write a book. And then I was interviewing women and then I turned it into a podcast. Then we got sponsors for the podcast, made 30 K. And I was like, oh, I should probably like look at this more like a business than as a book. And we spent $29,000 on the editing and the team and all of the different pieces of running the business that year. So uh, I, I paid myself $1,000 that year, which is, you know, when you ask, if you ask me my average salary over the years, that one's definitely going to anchor it low. And now, and then in starting a startup in the early years, you pay yourself 50K, 75K. You're like back in this tinier numbers with the idea that you're growing it to be able to pay yourself more. And I'm right at that precipice. So I had children, which cost a lot of money. And I started a company, which I am, we are now, we've doubled our revenue every year and we're in the fourth year. So we've got a great curve ahead of us, but I'm still at that precipice of like, will she, won't she, where's it gonna go? Really? <laughs> yes, totally. I mean, I'm pretty confident that we're doing pretty well, but there's still so much growth ahead of me where I, I'm excited and I'm nervous. And so as opposed to, you know, my podcast is designed as an educational tool, but also to promote my service-based business. So, um, but yours is different. Yours is more of a, a media empire because it's about the podcast and your revenue sources from sponsors, but then you also have this, this writing aspect to what you do. Is that correct? Cause you're not offering coaching. Or you so are we do the wise women's council. Yeah. So we launched in year two, we launched the wise women's council and the wise women's council is the nine month leadership incubator for women entrepreneurs navigating parenting right at those early parenting years and pregnancy. And we have 40 people in the program this year, which is, which is great. And some people sign up for executive leadership, executive coaching packages. Some people sign up for group coaching and some people sign up for the community. So we have three tracks. Um, it starts every March and next year we're looking at seeing if we can run two tracks at the same time. So 80 people. And then we're looking at expansion plans. Like what does it look like to have 200, 500 people running it through this program every year? Right. Um, who's we? 
I hired three coaches. You know, oh, okay. I have three, yeah, I have three coaches. I have an operations assistant and then I have a um, online business assistant. So like, I've also got, you know, people that I talk to. I used to be a solopreneur and now it's like, nope, we're getting this. We're getting all the dots dotted and the T's crossed. So you're getting official. And, uh, and then you had mentioned, so hundred K by 30 and a million by 40. Was there a goal by 50? No, it's more like a retirement goal. And I would love to retire early. Like I would love to be set financially by somewhere between 45 and 55 so that all of the work that I get to do in my life is by choice. That's part of my freedom dream. It's not quite fire, like financially independent, retire early. Cause a lot of people are trying to do that by younger, but I think the closer I can be to, Anywhere between like 2 million and 6 million, probably 4 million in savings, the easier it's going to be. And the way, the way that I always look at this is let's say you have a million saved, you expect 4% returns. You can withdraw 40,000 on that million. Um, I know you have to pay taxes on some of that, but like if, so this is like simple math, but if you could live off of $40,000 a year and you're happy living off of $40,000 per year, then you only need a million in savings to never have to work again. Awesome. <laughs> so for me, it's probably at the 4 million mark, right? So if I could withdraw 160K, then I would never have to work again, except I love working. Like for me, working would be writing and creating and helping people. And like, I would continue to grow the business. But so the goal probably by 50 would be like, what if I could have 4 million in the bank? Okay. So, so will you, you, are you on track for a million by 40? Not quite. So I'm turning 38 and we've got half a million. I say we, I guess, cause I'm, I'm talking about my husband, but yeah, I've saved 500,000 into my retirement savings, which I looked at it and I took a screenshot. I'm now a little afraid of sending it to my dad. Cause I'm like, is this okay? Right. Money can be so challenging to talk about, but I don't think I'm going to save half a million dollars in the next two years, but I do think I'm going to hit the goal pretty close to 40, which is going to be pretty fun. Well, you never know your entrepreneurship efforts could really mushroom. I mean, these things have a, a way of kind of taking off once you've got everything's energetically aligned, right. And you've supported the business with the people it needs and the marketing it needs. Um, so what have been your stumbling blocks along the way? Student loan debt is one of the biggest ones. I think that like that, that has taken a lot of effort to figure out, you know, how do I work through that? The cost of childcare, the cost of child rearing. Like if I could go back and tell 20 somethings, any advice, it's like actually now is a great time to save, right? If things get more expensive as you get older. <laughs> I know it sounds extraordinary, but like, I just, I didn't drink in bars. I chose not to, right? Yeah. I, that was so expensive. And I learned how to cook all my own food. And there's a bit of savviness here, but it, it comes not from telling you that this is what you have to do. It comes from those things weren't important to me. I right. wanted to spend time with people. I didn't care what alcohol, like what sugar alcohol I got. Right. And so that's, you know, I made some choices that were maybe a little bit different than my peers, but it really helped. Other stumbling blocks. Oh, those children. I love them. I love them. They are so expensive and they take so much time. <laughs> <laughs> and then this pandemic, you know, we had a healthy emergency savings in place, which we were very fortunate to have. I've been, uh, I guess I would also say, you know, the earlier question about fear or not about fear, sorry, your earlier question about like the emotional landscape and your financial narratives. I'm always a little bit cautious. I'm always a little bit afraid and a little pragmatic. So we had a good emergency savings and we blew half of it. We spent half of it in the pandemic. And that was terrifying to me. And I had to constantly remind myself like, this is what an emergency savings is for. This like, is the this emergency. Literally, <laughs> this is the emergency, right? Like, and, but your body feels it. My body was like, this is the emergency. And I still had trouble spending it. And so now we're, we're rebuilding it, which is part of the reason why I think it's going to take maybe a couple more years to get our ducks lined up. You said something to me that I thought was uh, really tremendously insightful. You said, if you want the $500 a month gym, just earn $6,000 a year more. <laughs> so I call those intermittent luxuries. Like everything in your life doesn't have to be balanced. I don't think it makes sense to drive a $100,000 car in any way if you're earning $40,000 a year. But if you want a $6,000 a year gym, like do it. Or if you want a Louis Vuitton bag, or if you want a $10,000 vacation, like figure out a way to make it happen. Even if it doesn't seem balanced with the rest of your financial life. 
So what are some, uh, is the $6,000 a year gym real for you? Or is there something else that you do that is just a real pleasure source of pleasure for you? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I it's, see, I think, I think when you get really specific about it and you get concrete about the numbers, you're like, oh my gosh, this gym is like $600 a month or this vacation is this much. When you actually look at it, it's concrete. Most of these things aren't going to be much more than $10,000. And I would add a little caveat, like pick one this year. Pick one or two luxury items each year that you want to get. And then if, you're, if your numbers don't balance, get creative about it, right? How can I earn $6,000 this year? Like, what could I do on the side? Could I host a retreat? Could I do some private tutoring? Like, what are the options of it? Could I just ask for the raise I deserve, right? What are some options for doing, to earning more money? And so for me, I would definitely say books. If we've ever met before, you will see how many books I have in my house. It's almost a hazard. I believe that- um, I do see two large stacks of books behind you right those now. Those are the ones I want to read like this summer. Um, this whole wall is like full of books. They're all color organized. I'd have to show you. But I, I never limit myself in the number of books. I think I probably spend several thousand dollars a year on books. I also have like multiple library cards. And um, I just- I, I like it's part of it's energetic. I, everybody who writes a great book, I want to pay them for their efforts. Like it's $9 for their multiple years of research. Like I want more of that thinking in the world. I'll never be able to go to coffee with all these people, but this is the best coffee date I'll ever have with them because they're that smart, right? This is them at their smartest, ideally. Like they've spent so much time and then I want to be able to have the deep conversation. So books and education, I will always spend money on. Education has to be commensurate with the, co the spend. Like $9 to $20 in a book is, is ridiculously amazing for a price. Yes. Uh, 250,000 for an MBA. You've got to be really like understand what the benefit is for you. <laughs> they better be offering me a $500,000 a year gig after graduation, right? That's right. That's right. Okay. So, um, how do you manage money with your husband? It sounds, I would guess you're the quarterback of the financial team in that marriage. Am I correct? We are really good together. Um, we, so we do, a uh, we have a budget that we share and we each can go in and review it, re review it maybe every six months, but we basically get the flows. Like I see it as like a flow chart. We understand where things go. And then we have a cash envelope system, but we use Ally Bank because there aren't any fees. And then we just have, we you see my wallet, but I have like seven different debit cards because each debit card is linked to our different accounts. So we agree beforehand what we're going to spend money on. And then we each have our own personal account because I don't like, I think one of the worst things in a partnership is when you're micromanaging each other. And like, if I want to buy thong underwear and gum, like I don't need him to know about that. And no, if he and wants to buy his comments, <laughs> no, like, it, like, unless the underwear looks good, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but, but, sorry. but like, and if he wants to buy it on video games and candy, like uh, these are just arbitrary examples. Um, like let yourself spend without anyone looking over your shoulder. Just agree on how much goes in the account beforehand. That's what we do. Like we just both get a certain amount of money and it's, it's like an allowance kind of, but it's, we just get to spend it on what we want. No questions asked. Yeah. Beautiful. And you, and you have created a partnership where you, it sounds like you pretty much agree on the big stuff. Yeah. In other words, you were both agreed that it was time to spend down the emergency fund when it was. Yes, that's right. That's right. We like we had our children home for seven months last year with no childcare. We were basically trapped inside of an apartment. We didn't have a backyard. We had no family around. Like we were like anything that makes this better, just anything. And we literally pulled out my credit card and we're like, it's all going on here and we're going to deal with it later. Like that was our mindset through it. And it was like ordering food, ordering takeout, ordering games. We bought a second iPad. We bought headphones for the kids. Like it, it's also like, it's, it's hard to spend obscene amounts of money on these small purchases. Like we did, we did spend, a, a, like, like I said, we spent half of our emergency savings. We also moved in the middle you of the moved. pandemic. Yeah. 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 So like there's just, and then now, right now it's June of 20, it's almost July of 2021. We are, we have slowed the spending down back within our budget. And now we're starting to gain on our savings again. Okay, great. Well, I just think this is fantastic. I think it's such an alternative view. I mean, when you tap into business podcasts and even money podcasts, I think the unstated assumption is that more, more, more is better, better, better. And I think that that pursuit can lead to a lot of dissatisfaction 
for people. And so it's just so refreshing to hear you. And, you know, I asked about your emotional landscape with money. You didn't use the word satisfied. Would you, how would you describe yourself as financially satisfied? Do you have peace of mind? Yeah, it's hard. It, that's a, that's like a good question to check in with all the time. Yes. And it's one of those, like, I do have my next goals, but I've been really satisfied hitting my goals so far. And I feel confident. I feel like lightly confident and pretty satisfied that we're doing a good enough job. Like it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be a good enough job. Like, Hey, what makes me happy? And how much money do I need to do that? As opposed to, I think it's a little bit convenient. It's too convenient to take somebody else's goal. If you should make as much money as possible. And sometimes we, we swap that in for, instead of understanding ourselves. That's amazing. Thank you so much for being willing to tell your story. I, I just know you're going to bring so many people peace of mind. It's just refreshing to hear like, you can be happy no matter what, just save some of it and you'll be all right. Eventually, <laughs> like really get to the core of what you as a human being want in this life. And you can make that happen. And save right. a little, make a little, be happy. Thanks <laughs> be so much happy. for having me. <laughs> Anything else you'd like to say before we wrap? Uh, you know, figuring out what you want isn't an instantaneous thing. Like if somebody's listening to this and they're like, but I don't know what I want. I would say that's great. Now, you know, that that's your next question, right? right? And spend the next year, like doing experiments and testing. Like, huh, do, do I spent money on this? Do I like it? I tried this. Do I like it? Like, do I like my job? And, and do gentle inquiry and observation. And through iteration, you can actually get really cool insights. I love it. I, I do remember a time in my life when I would have said, I have no idea what I want. And I agree. Life comes at you fast after you put some decisions in place, marriage, kids, a house, a, you know, pick a career and you learn, you learn experientially. This is not working for me. Or That's right. That's right. Something has to change. Right. And at least, you know, something has to change. And then, and then your next job isn't to like have a perfect answer and then do it. Your next job is to like, try a little and see. Love it. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. As we wrap things up here for today, I need to review with you the things I have to disclose as a fiduciary financial advisor offering wealth management services through my firm, Hendershot Wealth Management, LLC. You should know that the opinions I express on Profit Boss Radio are my own and they can change. The content I provide in the show is for general education. It's not intended as specific investment advice, nor do I recommend any specific financial products. Unlike how I roll at home with my husband, I can't guarantee that my statements, opinions, or forecasts are always 100% right. Of course, I wish I could peek into that proverbial crystal ball, but so far, I haven't found it. Past performance is not indicative of future results. I talk a lot about indexes and I want you to know you can't actually buy an index because of course when you take a list of companies and create a product that allows people to invest in those companies, there are fees and expenses involved that reduce returns. Remember, all investing involves risk, which as you know, means you could lose your money. And I have to tell you that there is no guarantee that any investment plan or strategy will be successful. And that should keep my lawyers happy. Have a great day.